Hey guys, um, how's everybody doing out there? My Vernon Kid here is back again. Um, yes, yeah, been a while. Um, you know, things that came up, big things, Mother Nature wise, but I just want to let everybody know um, that I'm okay. And thanks for all the concerns for all of my subscribers out there. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, from one to one hurricane, we here in New York we got our first fall snow, which is actually kind of cool because um I like snow and and um the fact that uh, I'm o I've always I'm always wishing and hoping that if this is a sign of what's to come in sent in terms of Christmas wise, you see because I uh, I've always one thing I've always wished for Christmas is always a white Christmas, but that's just a little bit about. Uh, other things, but you guys are here for the comic reviews, so I got a lot of books to cover for you guys. Um, not the books for this week. I'll definitely get that up later on this week as well. But um, books for the last two weeks, and so this is another big exercise edition episode, and if you may, and um, it was it was good. A lot of the books were good this week that I picked up. Uh, for the last two weeks, and I'm just gonna talk about a couple of them. Um, might go through a little bit, lot, lot of them fast, but you know, but other than that, it'll. You, I think you guys will still enjoy it as much. Um, so we'll still kick. We'll kick off the last books that came out in October, and we'll keep the lineup as, as I always presented it. You know, DC, sandwich with the uh, independent, and then ended with Marvel. So um, we're going to do last week, uh, no, not the October 31st, but the following week's books. So we'll kick it off with uh, uh, Batman the Dark Knight number 13. Uh, Greg Hurwitz and David Finch are s still do a good job um, for making Jonathan Crane just unbelievably freaky and disturbed and it's just shown in this book that he has Bruce at his mercy and even in, uh, exposes Bruce to a toxin fear toxin that even he has no antibodies against in terms of the scarecrow usually you can't really inject scarecrow with his own toxin fear toxin but this time he created one that just he doesn't have immune to, um, but it was real good. David Finch's artwork is still great, and um, this uh, team up, this uh, new creative team seems to work very well, um, indeed. <clears throat> uh, next up, Flash number thirteen, Guerrilla Warfare. Mr. Manipool is, you're a freaking genius, <laughs> I swear to, um, you talk about putting all of, almost every villain in the sense of Flash's rogues together in one book, you get magic here, uh, just, I'm still gonna try to not spoil it as much, even though this book's been out for two weeks or so. But uh, let's just put it like this. Grodd invades. The gorillas invade. And he brings his gorilla forces, King Grodd. And this is still coming off of the last issue of the annual, I believe, where pretty much Flash is at the mercy of the rogues. And the rogues are like, gorillas. <laughs> it is really funny. Um, and they all know that once they start hearing that the the they're not after them, the the rogues are like, Lou, let, let's split. Like that, that ain't our problem. And I love how Flash just put it down. Like this is your city too. Like, what are you doing? One of them said basically like you know the enemy of my enemy, until the gorilla started attacking them. Trickster, oh my God, what happens to Trickster? In this is not even funny. Uh, he. 
What I will say is Trickster approaches Grodd and something bad happens. I'm not going to spoil it, even though this book has been out for all. But it was still very superb, very good. Francis Moonapool is still doing a good job. I tip my hats to him as always. And um, keep up the good work. Flash number 13. <clears throat> Red Lanterns, number 13. Uh, this is the Red Lanterns introduction into the rise of the Third Army. I definitely will agree with uh, my mentor when he reviewed this. Uh, Peter Milligan, good stuff. Definitely, uh, we're now we're starting to see the third army or whatever they're called kind of showcasing a little bit more of a oomph for me. You know, more of like, okay, now I'm a little bit interested because the last two introduction them, I was just like, okay, that's it. And um, it's Atrocitus' group going after, comes into contact with them. And then it just shows you right here that he may be full of rage, Atrocitus, but he definitely respects and cares for his Red Lantern Corps. He does care. And he, um, <clears throat> he definitely uh, has some factors to deal with in this. And does he overcome dealing with the Red or the uh, Third Army? Yeah, he does. But uh, it's how he does it, which I'm not going to spoil. Like I said, once again, book's been out, but still, still not going to spoil. Um, I was very much impressed at this. Um, I was glad to see that uh, Rancor, the Earthling Red Lantern, is still around and about. And um, he held his own pretty well. Belize held her own. Um, but one um, member of the Red Lantern Corps didn't. I won't spoil who that was. All right. Oops. I'll get that ready. Um, Superman number 13. Uh, this is the prologue into Hell on Earth. Uh, this is what we've been seeing in the past. Um... DC books, uh, basically, the concept is we see Superman actually working out, yeah, he's working out on a machine that is pushing his strength to the limits, in a sense, it's like he's carrying, he's bench pressing, this machine is giving him, giving the impression he's benching the earth, times a trillion and it, it, it and it's so cool is the fact that he actually perspires a little bit so it's like wow superman actually sweating um and he he really gets a kick out of it he's like you know things like that um there's also some setbacks with the daily planet you know um perry white and lois lane they're they're like you know clark you're the superman guy you're supposed to and clark is really like Yo, I don't, I don't, I'm not his stalker. Like, literally, I'm not his stalker. And there's some other things I want to do, Perry. And they're like, no, you're the Superman guy. You you report on him. And this, Clark really kind of puts his foot down and is like, look, I'm not, that's not what I want to do. Like, you know, what, what happened to the old days of news reporting when news was news in a sense? Um, which uh, actually had me, you know, like, wow. And then he kind of got in Lois's face a couple of times. Lois is more like all texting now back to her boyfriend and things like that. And when he, Clark kind of sets them straight, it was almost like, where'd that come from? Uh, so I got to give him credit. Uh, got to give, yes, Scott Liddell some credit on that. Um, but it also showcases Superman fights this giant dragon, like which actually is a prehistoric creature from Krypton, and that's kind of where it kind of ends, where he stops this, and Supergirl comes and you know says that you know Clark's been lying to her and everything like that, you know because that creature that you fought was from Krypton, so Krypton is still around. But they don't see that somebody else is watching them. And I won't spoil who that is. But um, 
I'm hoping, I'm finally hoping they kind of get off this whole subject of, you know, Superman and Kara almost coming to blows. Because even when she came, he was like, he's like, Kara, I, I don't have time to be going blow for blow with you and things like that. It was, it was kind of funny. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping she is like, look, I'm your cousin. Get used to it. You, you were, I'm older than you now. So, you know, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, and uh, we kick off the only book of the third wave of DC books that I was interested in. Uh, Talon number one. Uh, Scott Schneider and James Ty Ty Eon the fourth uh, both co-plot this as well. Um, but I think it's uh, James. Uh, Taeyeon that actually writes this. Um, so uh, Calvin Rose, the the uh, t Talon that escaped the Court of Owls, returns back to Gotham, and he knows he shouldn't be there because the Court of Owls are still looking for him. And he he runs into a situation that has him going blow for blow with one of the Talon members. Now. This story kind of picks up almost right after the Court of Owls story arc. So a lot of the Owls, a lot of the Talons have been put away and things dealt with. But we find out that not all, the Court of Owls did not release all of the Talons. And we see it in his book. And it's to the point where Calvin also comes into contact with a man who wants to destroy the core of the Court of Owls. He gives Batman credit for what he did. He he says the Bat actually scared them a little bit. He actually gave them a little fear. You know what I'm saying? But they're like any snake. You cut the head off. And we kind of see that. Now, um, Calvin is more like, look, I don't want to be a part of this. But then later on, the man, I'm forgetting the man's name, the gentleman that talks and basically tells him, like, look, they're going to keep coming after you no matter what. And they're going to come after um, uh, Carrie Washington, the woman that you refused to kill on behalf of the, the Court of Owls. They're going to come after her. They're going to kill her baby and her. So in a sense, it's almost like Calvin has no choice. Uh, we finally see him put on the look that you see here at the end. And he's just basically like, let's get to work. Um, Talon's been really good. Um, you can still see Snyder is all over that book. And that's what's up. You know what I'm saying? All right. Um, Teen Titans, number 13. Uh, the Bloody Or... Oops, dropped my book. Sorry. <laughs> um... Sorry about that, guys. Uh, the bloody origin of Wonder Girl. No, it wasn't. It wasn't bloody at all. But here's the new 52 origin of Wonder Girl. Cassie Sandsmore. There are still some elements of her being, her mom being an archaeologist and everything like that. They still keep that. Um... It just shows off where the armor came from that she wears and who it could have ties to in terms of Trigon. I was like, whoa, okay. I'm a little interested in this. Um, and Cassie's just telling Rob, uh, Tim and Superboy her origin, which uh, wasn't that bad. Um, it's just that uh, that's false advertising right there because it, it wasn't bloody at all. That's pretty much it. Okay, so those are all the DC books that came out the last week. Um, we move on to Dynamite. I got two Dynamite books to cover for you. Bless you. Um, first and foremost, uh, we'll kick it off with Lord of the Jungle, number eight. Yeah, Tarzan, baby. Uh... This seems to be the final part of the Concrete Jungle story arc that's been going on where Tarzan is in uh, 18th century 
uh, Baltimore. He's got a job. He works construction. You know, he's just trying to be closer to Jane, even though he knows he can't have her because Jane is to marry Clayton. Who, however, there was a mobster known as our Carl Can 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 Lar Can Lar, who basically was the former fiance of. Jane, Jane Porter, and he just really tried to nearly abuse uh, uh, Jane. I'm not talking physically, like slapping her around, things like that, but he would, you know, just totally disrespect her, grab her around, you know, you go where I go, you know, you, you do this woman, and things like that. And Tarzan set him straight out of that. However, he was like, this ain't over eight, man. So what he does is kidnap Jane and her father to lure. Tarzan out to deal with him. However, the Lord of the Jungle is up to the task at hand, and as always, Tarzan makes these mobsters look like cannon fodder. Okay? And it's to the point where Tarzan has Kenlar at his mercy, and he says, basically, in the jungle, there is no mercy. It's kill or be killed. But here, I'll show mercy. But if you ever come after Jane or her father or anybody else again, I will kill you. And pretty much Tarzan just set him straight. Like, yeah, I will kill you. Um, but uh, it kind of ends on a sour note because Tarzan leaves to go back to Africa. You know, he's like, you know, I'm time to return back to the jungle you know um it's, it's kind of sad because you know tarzan and jane you know they're a famous fictional literary couple I mean, we all know about tarzan and jane you know the the educated sophisticated civil woman fall in love with a man who was raised by apes in the jungles of africa and they're not together um, where Tarzan basically says to Clayton, like, good luck with Jane and everything like that. You're a lucky man. And when he's walking away from the train station, he throws away the paper, a paper, a manuscript paper that when he misses the trash can. So Clayton picks it up and reads it. And it says basically what we all been knowing is that Tarzan here is the true Lord of Greystone. And... Clayton sees that and he's like, oh my God, like, and as soon as Jane comes, he throws it away because he knows like if Jane finds out, like I'll lose her. And that was kind of, uh, you know, like, oh man. But uh, the next story arc is called Return, Return Back, Return to the Jungle. I'm looking forward to seeing where they go with that. Um, a little false advertising with the cover as well. There was no white tiger in there. It's just a cool cover of Tarzan, just looking fierce, as always. But uh, I've been really enjoying Lord of Jungle um, very much. Uh, very much, indeed. All right. So we move on from the Lord of the Jungle to the Shadow. Now, Garth Ennis and Aaron Campbell. This is issue number six. First of all, that is a badass cover of Alex Ross. Look at that cover. Very nice. Very, very nice. Um, this deals with the outcome of Did the Shadow catch up to General um, General uh, Takashi uh, Oh, God. Uh, Kando. Condo, yeah, there we go. Condo, um, in a sense, yes, but in a sense, not. Um, the major thing that I, I really thought was the coolest that how the shadow, as we always, the, all the emphasis on is the shadow knows, it is like he may have gotten away, but he realizes that uh, Condo is not gonna be around for a long time, 
and he may have his luxury place in Osaka, Japan, and uh, no, um, in uh, Hiroshima, Japan, and you should know where I'm going at with this. And the shadow is telling everybody, you know, what's going to happen to him. Um, and remember, this takes place during the war, the World War II. So what happened to Hiroshima? Yeah, we see the bomb come down and he, he's killed in the process. And he's like, you know why I know? Because I know. And I was like, oh, shit, that's the shadow for you. He knows you think you get away from him, but you don't. Um, which was fine. This was good stuff. Um, I think this was the last issue for Garth Ennis. I think um, a new creative team comes on um, with the next issue, which came out this week, which I haven't read yet. So, um, yeah. But this was good. And I love that cover, Alex Ross. I can't wait to that series, The Mask, come out, where he com he does the entire book. Good stuff. Um, so that's all the independent for... You know where I'm going out with that. <laughs> um, so we move on to the Marvel stuff. So we'll kick it off with uh, the world's greatest superhero, The Amazing Spider-Man number 696. Dan Slott, uh, Gage, and Cam Camutico uh, is on this. It's basically the confrontation between the two Hobgoblins, in a sense. The original and the new one. And it was fun. Um, Peter is at the mercy of the Kingpin and the Hand and everybody like that because they still have that device that's really messing with his, putting his spider sense in overdrive, and he can't really stand, he can barely stand. Um, and... It was okay. This issue was okay. It wasn't that good. Yeah, shocker, right? It wasn't that good. I totally have to agree. Um, but it, it seemed to put more emphasis on the confrontation between these two and less on, you know, Spidey, in a sense. Um, and that's pretty much all I got to say about it. It wasn't bad. It was just, I was, okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so I finally caught up, guys, on a book that you probably have not seen on my reviews in a while. And I apologize, you know, just sometimes you, after I've caught up, I forget to post it or something like that. But Astonishing X-Men number 55, uh, Modric Lou, still excellent, excellent job on the book. Um, I like that cover. You, you got a gun and a clip. You got the X-Men like in a clip. Um, the X-Men are in Madripoor and the woman that is has pretty much is literally blackmailing them to do what she tells them to do or she, she'll she use the device she planted to kill them. In a sense. We saw it happen with uh, Wolverine. Um, the woman is the sister of Karma and uh, she wants them to overthrow take over Madripoor, the leader of Madripoor is a woman known as Tiger Tiger. And, uh, of course, uh, Wolverine knows her, and Wolverine goes to Madripoor back in his his old patch identity. You remember his, his patch identity where he once wore the eye patch because um, he lost his eye and it was still healing from it? Um, and I love how she was like, Logan, why are you wearing that? Everybody knows who you are. And he's like, I like it. I like dressing up. You know, it was funny. Um... We got a situation that Iceman may be dead. Pfft, yeah, right. Killing off Bobby is a big mistake. Um, but we also see, I love how when the X-Men are dealing with some of the people on Madripoor, most of them are fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat. Except for Northstar. And he was all like, oh my God, that was tough. And I love how Karma said, you rely too much on your mutant abilities. You know, and I love that. I love that they actually mentioned that. She's like, you rely on it too much. You, you, it's almost like you don't have any skills without your powers. So basically, almost she was literally saying, you're nothing without your powers. You're a speedster, and that's it. And I was like, 
hmm, maybe, you know, while everybody, Gambit, Karma, you know, De uh, Death Bird and all of them, they are dealing with these guys, hand-to-hand -hand style and everything like that. You got North Star, <sighs> and like, oh, my God, that was tough. But um, it was still good. Um, Marjorie Lou is still doing a very good job um, on this. She has taken over this book really when it needed to be, when they were, they were had different writers come along. Because I kind of dropped Astonishing X-Men, but when I heard Marjorie Lou is coming back, was going to do it, I picked it up, started picking back up um, around 40-something-ish. But uh, yeah, I'm caught up again on Astonishing X-Men. Good stuff. Okay, move on to still continuing Bendis' uh, final run on the Avengers. Avengers, uh, End Times. This is issue number 32 before they relaunch with the next volume of Avengers. Uh, Bendis, Matthew, and uh, Brendan Peterson is the art artist on this. Good stuff. The team is in the micro zone because they got a stress a dis distress call from somebody who used an old school Avengers uh, tr tracker device. You know, basically, Bendis doesn't give us the full team, gives us the founding members, actually, except for Hulk. He's not in this. So we got, and well, I won't say Cap because Cap's not. You know where I'm going. He didn't come into issue number four, Avengers. But he's not... Never mind. <laughs> Getting geeked out. The point is, it's Cap, Thor, Hank Pym, Tony. They go into the microzone to figure out who sent this call. When they get there, they find out who it is. And who is it? It's somebody I was talking about last time I reviewed with the last issue, who I was thinking on. And you know what, people? I was right. Janet Van Dyne is alive and well. She did not die during the Secret Invasion. And she even says it. You guys thought I died? She didn't die. And it's kind of explained how she survived. Um, But I'm not going to take a gift horse in the mouth. It's, glad, it's good to see Janet alive and well. Um, I like the Wasp. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I'm a fan of the Wasp. And I did like, I do glad to see that. And Janet goes around just, she's all happy, like, yay, I did it. I got you guys to come. And, you know, she's going around kissing everybody. She, she kisses, she kisses Cap. She kisses Thor. She kisses Tony. And, you know, she kisses Hank. But the thing about it, all of them kind of kiss her in a, like, let me show you in a sense, like, like, you do realize she's Hank's uh, wife, right? You know, it's, it's kind of funny. But um, here we go. Uh, I'll show you. There's a, there's Janet with the gun. Uh, and there she goes, kissing everybody. <laughs> you see? Hank, Thor, Iron Man, and you see her just yelling, yay! Um, in the micro zone, microverse, basically, you know, she tells him like, you know, you think you saw me die during a, oh no. See, she basically shows us, see, that's not what happened. And we don't really get in the, we going to get more of the story of how she survived in the next issue, which came out this week. Um, I kind of skipped ahead up. Sorry guys. Um, but we realize that she has made some enemies in the micro zone. <laughs> Renly, this centaur looking dude right here. Um, yeah, I said centaur because look, he's half he's got a horse body. His name is uh Lord uh Gon Gonzar. Uh he seems to be like the big head honcho of this city that they're in. Um but yeah, it was you know it's not like I'm like, look. It, it it was just like you know, okay she's back you know and and wonder man is really trying guys he he's back and he's trying really hard to make up for what he's done over the past years when he kind of went kind of crazy 
in a sense. So he's he's trying. He even says it. I'm trying. I'm really trying. But yeah, it was it was good. Uh, Avengers versus X Men Consequences number three. Uh, Gillian Scott Eaton is the artist on this. Um, this was good. The best thing, the best uh, part of this book to me was the confrontation between Kitty and Emma. And whew, woo, yeah, it got it got really good. Emma, the bitch, and Kitty. Kitty, I wouldn't say she was gloating, but she really set Emma straight. And I love that line that she uses where she basically says, you know, we're not so different, you and I, Emma. We both stood kind of by our men in terms of Colossus and Cyclops. The only problem is, the only difference is, I knew when to walk away. And I was like, ooh, take that, Emma. It's like, yeah, take that. You know, um, Cyclops in this is still in the prison, and I don't know what to think of this. I, I really don't. What What is he? Is he trying to be a martyr, or is he, or it's just really hard for me to think and like that. Um, yeah, it, it was just really weird in a sense. Um, and of course, you have Cyclops talking to. Uh, Magneto in the prison, and you know, Cyclops want us to break you out. Everything, no, you know, do that. Magic comes to Storm and says, "Go find my brother," yeah, and you know, things like that. And um, it gets crazy. And you also see Hope trying to lead a, a, a normal life. She's going to high school. She's doing this, but it's not really working out for her. You know, yeah, that was cool. All right, um. Captain America 19, the final issue of Captain America. However, final issue for Mr. Ed Brubaker. Uh, first of all, it was good to see Eppington come back to do the artwork with, um, you know, Brubaker for his last piece. Basically, the story is Cap is talking with another man who Don the costume, but during the 50s. And he's really injured. He's in an undisclosed shield hospital. Cap's telling the story about how, you know, everything like this, what it means to be Captain America, no matter, you know, how much he was scared to do it. You know, get really depth into what Steve is all about. You know, everybody thinks he's, he's just, oh, you know, you know, but it, it actually showcases Steve being... That he had fears as well, even when he became the super soldier as he is. Um, but it was really good. Um, a very good, solid way to end Brubaker's long, very strong run of Cap. And now I'm going to talk a little bit to Mr. Brubaker. And I know he's not watching, but Mr. Brubaker, I want you to know, realize this, sir, is that you did a good job on this book with this character. You, I saw the love for Cap when in your writing. And though it is very sad for me to see you leave this book and go on to do independent, more independent stuff, I will continue to follow wherever, wherever your work takes us as fans, me as a fan. There will probably never be anyone, in a sense, that will probably come as close to what you did and what you captured for Steve Rogers. Though I am looking forward to Hickman's run when the next volume of Cap comes out, but you will always stand the test of time the best Captain America writer ever. Well before Kirby and, you know, all of them, and, you know, S Simon. But you will always be up there at that pedestal, sir. And I want to tip my hat to you and show my love and respect for you for what you did with Steve Rogers, Captain America. Because um, both of your series are coming to an end. 
not just Cap. Cap happened first, but later on, Winter Soldier's ending. You really know how to write super spy espionage very well. You blend Cap into that world along with everybody else so well. That's why I've always said, do you play games like Metal Gear Solid and watch all these great you know, spy dramas because you are just a master at it? You will always be one of my favorite writers. And um, I'm going to miss you, sir, on this book. So once again, Mr. Brubaker, I tip my hat to you. Much love and respect. Keep up the good work wherever you go. God bless you. And um, sorry, guys, I had to do that. Brubaker is one of my favorite writers, and um, it's going to be really sad to see him leave. All right. So we move from Captain America on to Gambit number four. And James Admus is still, still tells a very good, delightful, and gearing, adventurous story with the Raging Cajun and his adventures in Guatemala with the mysterious woman who has helped get this device out of him that was literally draining him. But now he's dealing with, get this, uh, King Ghidra like monster in a sense, <laughs> um, which was fine. I, I was, I was okay with it, but it, it was a little bit, felt a little bit like supernatural, a little supernatural to it, but, uh, it was still fun. Gambit really uh, does his thing in this book, as well as uh, kind of showcase. You know, it's like he's he's looking at the woman after he saves her, and he's like, she's all like, you know, thank you for saving, and then do me a favor, don't do it again. And Gambit's like, qu'est-ce que c'est? Like, you know, basically that's what he said. You know, qu'est-ce que c'est? Like, what? Like, you know. Yeah, I saved your life. Like, you know, you, you know, things like that. Like, and she's like, and then Gambit starts coming to the conclusion that this woman, the mysterious woman that he's been with so far, she wants to die or something like that. And she's like, Gambit's like, who are you? Like, what are you? And she kind of, <laughs> she kind of knocks him out. And Gambit's like, oh, okay. And it kind of ends on a cliffhanger when Gambit comes back to the States. The man he stole, he stole from, is waiting for him at the airport. And it's like, dun, dun, dun. Okay, what's next for Gambit? Um, but like I still said, Gam uh, James Admus, um, Mr. Admus is still doing a very good job. And man's artwork suits Gambit very well. Um, this has just been a really fun series. And I'm glad... Marvel has given the Raging Cajun another run. Let's just hope it gets over 12 or 26 issues. You know what I'm saying? I can only hope. All right. Uh, Punisher Warzone. This is Gre uh, Greg Roca's last uh, piece for Punisher. The bottom line is... This still is picking up right where the last issue of Punisher left off, where they set the the exchange set Punish Frank up, where they killed all these cops. His partner and kind of Rachel Coles took the fall. She was arrested. Frank is he wants to get her out, you know, in, in a sense. Um. And everybody's going on like the front pun Punisher across the line. He's crossing the line now. He, he killed cops, and everybody's like, but that's not his MO. He doesn't kill cops, everything like that. And you got these two rent a cops saying, man, if he he was here, man, I'd lock him up. And they're like, yeah, that's, you know, you got it, brother. Like, we take the Punisher down. And you see Frank just walk right by them. You know, like, you know, I was like, oh, shit, that was funny. But it gets to the point where. Frank is going to like a in a parking lot and who comes to meet him and that is none other than um Spider-Man. Yeah. 
Um, Pete really uh, beats the crap out of Frank. He's literally beating the crap out of him. Um, he's just telling Frank, you know, I can't believe you did that. I always said, Frankie, you're crazy. You were crazy, everything like that. But I, I, I always thought you had a little bit of love for the police. Like, you know, you were kind of buddy-buddy with the cops. Like, you crossing the line, everything like that. And Peter really starts getting into it, Frank. And Frank is truly outmatched. You know, Peter's like, I'm faster than you. I'm stronger than you. Basically, Peter's more upset the fact that Frank used web shooters, his web shooters, to cause a lot of this stuff. And he's, you use creations of mine to do this stuff. And he, Peter's just really upset. He's mad. And uh, I love the line where uh, Peter actually says to Frank, I don't get you. Like, you think you're the only one who lost someone that you care about? And Peter like literally says, get in line, you know, get in line. And it's almost like literally Peter was saying, like, you don't see me going out killing people and things like that. And unfortunately, Punisher is always kind of prepared. But still, I don't see how he was able to catch Spidey off guard like he did. It was kind of weird for me to watch that. You know, his spider sense should have went off, but it didn't. Anyway, um, we, you know, Frank is still like, I don't want to hurt you and everything like that. Because deep down, Frank does like Spider-Man. He does. He he actually has respect for Spider-Man. But um, he takes <laughs> Peter's web shooter again. And when Peter wakes up, he's like, oh, not again. So that's when we pick up why it's the Punisher and the Avengers. And Peter comes to the Avengers Mansion, and you got Thor, Cap, Wolverine, Black Widow, and Tony basically there. And he comes in, and they're like, who who calls the distress call? And he's, Spidey comes in, like, I did. Throws the paper down. We got to deal with this. And they're all like, yeah, okay. So anyway, and then they start to walk away, and Peter webs the door. And he's like, no, you're going to listen to me. I'm not joking around this time. This is serious. We got to stop him and everything like that. And Cap realizes that, you know what? Spidey's right. Like, you know, by not doing anything, we're condoning what Frank does in a sense. And Steve says, like, we can't just put him in jail. If we catch him, we can't put him in jail. Tony, do you got an idea? He's like, yeah, I got an idea. And I guess this is where the concept of why he joins the Thunderbolts later on during the Marvel Now. Um... And, you know, Tony's more like, why should we do? He's, 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 he's like minor leagues for us. Like, he doesn't even have powers or anything like that. And it was like, you wanted to slap Tony. But when he said that, Thor was really in, in, intrigued by the Punisher. He's like, I never, like, I never knew too much about this man. Tell me more. So the first person that's going to go after him is Widow. So we're going to see in the next issue, um, which is a five-part limited series that, Widow is going to go after Frank. Cap and Wolverine are there, and Wolverine literally goes to see Frank in one of his secret armory bunkers. And, you know, <laughs> Wolverine's like, friendly here, like, for now, like, friendly here. And Frank's like, watch the tripwire. And Wolverine tells Frank, like, they're coming after you. The Avengers are coming after you. Um, They're coming after you, and... You know, Frank, what did you do? And everything like that. He's he's giving Frank a little bit of like a heads up about this. Now, I can understand it because Frank and Wolverine have mutual respect for each other. So I can I get it. You know, Frank uh, Wolverine knows, you know, Frank a little bit, you know, knows how he thinks and everything like that and understands his anger and his rage. So it was actually kind of good to see that. But it is going to be good to see you know, <laughs> Widow. And Frank go at it, the super spy and the former Marine going at it. You know, I wonder how they're going to deal with it. But um, I'm really looking forward to seeing if when Frank comes into contact with <laughs> Thor, that's going to be interesting. Um, I got to see how he gets his way out of that. But I, I say this, if Frank could get his way out of Sentry, then he could probably get his way out of Thor Odinson. But it was good, nonetheless. It was good. Um, you can still see Greg Roker still cares for the character, but 
it's just a shame that you know he, he's being literally pushed out you know uh secret avengers number 33 uh rick remender still is now gearing us into the descendants who are these animatronic life models of different uh people you got a doom bot right there eric o'grady black ant um eric o'grady is dead the eric o'grady we thought was here is actually with the descendants and he sets his plan in motion to take out the uh, secret avengers headquarters the you know the the uh lighthouse that orbits earth we also see eddie brock and valkyrie getting it on and it's like woo, go eddie like you you jump from betty brant to a goddess and it was kind of interesting because you know um eddie's like i mean Ed, what I say, eddie brock i mean flash you know what i mean you see flash like whoa, whoa wait wait now um what is this is this lust or and she just said shut up it's lust and it, there's just it was getting you know, not bad right you know until um members of the descendant come in and attack them and flash is not in the symbiote valkyrie has to protect him you know protect him because and um it actually uh it was actually really good um a lot of things they took the original human torch a lot of things they took hank pym you know everything is going haywire they're burning the lighthouse um and they leave Valkyrie and Flash to nearly burn. Valkyrie is outside in space, just curled up. And I remember the last thing she said to him before uh, they kind of got, well, she got sucked out into space. She's out in orbit. She's still like near the, she turned to Flash and said it was more than lust. So it basically said that it, she does care about uh, Flash. And Flash is hanging on for dear life. He's trying to get to his. It ends with him trying to get to the symbiote, um, which is it was fine. Um, but uh, I was wrong to think that this was. I thought this was going to be the only Avengers title that wasn't going to get relaunched. This is also getting relaunched, and I don't mind because it it it's it's fine. Um, but uh, Black Ant, yeah. Uh, so bad, too bad Eric O'Grady is, is gone. Um, or maybe he isn't. We don't know. But um, it was fine. <sighs> Boy. Okay. So that's all the books that came out not last week, the following week that I picked up. Now we get, guys, so, uh, so right there, I'll give you a few minutes to catch your breath. Uh, you know, pause it, go to the bathroom, you know, do whatever you need to. And uh, I'll give you a few minutes till we go to the next one. All right, on to the next. So, uh, like I said, I'll give you a few breaks. Okay, <laughs> gave you a few minutes. Um, so, on to the books that came out for October 31st. And, um, uh, got a good, a decent amount. Only three DC books that I picked up last week. Three independent, and the rest are Marvel. All right. So let's kick it off with Aquaman. Yes, number 13, Jeff Johns, Ivan Reyes. It is going to be so sad to see Ivan Reyes not illustrating the book anymore. Do I agree with my mentor about, you know, this probably being the best that Jeff Johns writes? Absolutely. freaking um, Yes, it is. Uh, this is the best book Johns writes. Um... This is the end of the other story, and man, we get to see a lot in this book. Um, I love the line that Aquaman says about him being Aquaman. 
you know, that was, I, that caught me off guard when I first read that. I was like, wow. Like, wow, he actually thinks that, you know, it's, it's like Aquaman is not, Aquaman is just a, a suit. And I was like, whoa. But the battle between him, Aquaman, and Black Manta, oh, man. Talk about killer arch enemy battle. Yeah. Um, serious, serious smackdown drag out fight between the both of them. And uh, there's nothing more I can say about that. It was just great stuff. Um, very good indeed. I did like the ending also with the prisoner of war. Um, I thought his little, uh, they, they gave him like a little spotlight and I thought that was really good too. Um, yes, indeed. Aquaman number 13. Good stuff. All right. So we move on to another annual. And that annual is none other than the Bat Girl number, annual number one. The Bat, the Cat, and the Owl. Miss Gail Simone. My fanboy, yes, sorry. Uh, beautiful, well done writing in this. Um, Amira Wijaya, artwork in this was superb. I loved it. Um, the owl, you know, the talon that Barb Babs fought in later in, in the early issues. We see her in this again, and she's she's mute, and she can't talk, and we see her in the prison, and she, she's just like, she's up on like, she's almost like a, a owl, like she stands up on a roost. I remember the guard was like, Commissioner, she's up there, and, and he's she's just like, Commissioner's trying to get some word out of her, and he brings her like papers and crowns to talk to her, which is fine. She is ruthless, though. Um, then we enter Catwoman. Catwoman comes and she's like, you know, somebody's paying me a lot to get you out, everything like that. And it kind of like a, a truce happens between them. Batgirl is trying to figure out what's going on, everything like that. And, um, they come to blows, you know, they come meet face to face, uh, later on. Um, we find out that the Court of Owls are still alive and well. They're just licking their wounds in a sense. And um, that's when, you know, uh, Catwoman understands, like, look, I didn't sign up for any of this stuff. Like, you know, and her and you get to see her and Batgirl team up and fight the Talons as best they can. You know, you got to remember, these guys can pretty much heal from virtually anything. I mean, um, you know, just really much everything. And even to the point where the, the other Talon, the one that she, uh, she really is fighting. And then she literally says, I know what happened to you. You lost your people. The court of hours are killing innocent people. And she kind of turns on them. And it was kind of good. It was like, wow, okay. So this might be the introduction of another member of the court of hours turning, Talon's turning, in a sense. That's what That was kind of what I got from it. And at the end of the book, I was right. Um... I'm not going to spoil that too much, but, um, I mean, this book has probably been, has been out for a week, so everybody should know, but it seems that the character Mary, who is, you know, um, the talent, will be in Birds of Prey, because Catwoman told her to go with Batgirl, um, so my guess is Batgirl's going to take us to the birds, um, but yeah, this was just really good, guys, I enjoyed it so much, um, very much, like I said, um, mm, good stuff. All right, um, Masters of the Universe, uh, the origin of Skeletor. Um, J Joshua Hale, Fla uh, Flav Flavok, Flavok. I'm, I'm probably butchering that name. Um, I apologize. Um, tells an, the origin of Skeletor. And um, 
this really came off. It almost felt like Vader, actually. When I was reading this, it felt like it felt like um, he got his inspiration from Vader, uh, Darth Vader, the origin of An Anakin Skywalker and how he became Vader. Um, we see in this book that he, Skeletor, uh, Kaldor, before he was called Skeletor, is actually the brother of King Randor, you know, He-Man's father. And I was like, whoa, okay, that's interesting. That threw him like, arr, that threw me. And then um, they got really more into that. He became like a, a once again, like a, uh, of Hordak, basically. He became like the, the chosen one for Hordak. And we, it gets really like right from the get go. You see Kaldor and his face is melting off and things like that. Is like, and finally later, and he always through almost all the, the book. He's when he's telling his origin, you just see him looking for Randor. Like, where's Randor? Where's Randor? And when he finally comes in contact with Randor, he's telling him about this and everything like that. And Randor's like, I need you by my side, brother, to help me rule Eternia. And he's like, no, it was supposed to be me ruling. And, you know, it's kind of a little bit of broly spat. And then he's just like, I'm sorry, brother. And he stabs King Randor. Doesn't kill him, but he stabs him. And he's like, I need your blood. And pretty much that's where he goes back to Hordak. And this ritual goes under. And then he's like, rise, my apprentice, rise. Skeletor, and I'm like, oh my god, this is Darth Vader. I was like, yo, this is Darth Vader, but it was still good. Um, a, a nice touch, nice touch. I, uh, I give uh Mr. Uh, uh Fil um, out of out of five, I give it a four, four out of five, not bad. You know, Skeletor is a childhood memory of mine, and they never really, really went in depth with his origin like they did, but a little, a little creepy, very creepy, but saw a lot of Vader, Darth Vader in this book. Okay. So, move on to Independent. We'll kick it off with Green Hornet number 30. Um, reeling from the last issue, we saw the mayor of Century City just his first day in office, he just gets gunned down, shot right there. He's dead. And Hornet is, and Hornet and the gang are trying to figure out how that happened, who did it, everything like that. But also, this book also uh, focuses on the what happened between Mulan and Brit. They, 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 you know, they embraced each other. It was good. It was a well drawn scene. You know, they, you could just really feel the love of them making love. You know, and it was just like. Man, that was that was really good, but now Mulan is like it was a mistake. It shouldn't have happened, and I'm like, oh, don't do that, don't do that. And she, it was almost like she was gonna leave, and then Britt is telling her like, don't leave, like, you know, if not for me, stay for the city. And she, you know, she's like, okay, I'll stay, you know, but that's pretty much the gist of it. They're still trying to figure out who killed the mayor, uh. His status quo, Hornet's status quo in Century City is no longer um, public enemy number one. Um, he's working now. The cops are, like, really working with them. Like, they like, yeah, uh, we interrogate this guy. They bring him. He's like, we need you to come in and, t and help interrogate this guy. He's like, he's like, whoa, like, wow, this is impressive. But we do get to see the international criminal lord that's kind of setting everything in motion and now. He looks kind of creepy, um, definitely. But uh, yeah, Green Hornet number 30. Good stuff. Still good. Still very good. Dynamite is still killing it. Uh, I keep saying, guys, if you are not on Dynamite, get on something for Dynamite. I don't care what it is. I guarantee you, you will enjoy it. Uh, so we give you a double feature, guys, of the Turtles uh, for IDW. So first off, we'll kick it off with... Uh, Ninja Turtles number 15. Oh, uh, boy. Um, I watched my mentor's uh, review on this. 
I definitely have to agree with him. I think, I think it's Waltz who, or whoever the artist is. I think, yeah, I think it's time for a new regular artist because, um, it is kind of getting a little sloppy. I see a lot of choppiness and you know just a lot of things like okay, uh, but the gist of this book is we get another reimagining of a classic character, and I don't want to spoil who that is. But let's just say, ooh, was it good? And did he come off menacing? Yes. Did he come off fierce? Yes. Is it a he? Yes. Like I said. But I don't want to spoil who that is. Man, it just left you like really hoping for the, you know, just you're rooting for the turtles. Like, go, go, go. You know, go Leo. Go Raph. Go Donnie. Go Mikey, you know, don't let, you know, just, but it was good stuff. Very good indeed. Don't want to spoil who that, who that is. Once again, like I said, the book's been out for a, for a week by now, but still don't want to spoil it. And just like how my mentor said, this was only, this was only for you. If you're a true, true hardcore Turtles fan, like moi, um, the turtles are uh, annual, um, as you can see. Look how thick that that is. Like you can see, look, look at look at the side. Usually, a book never comes out that much in when you put it in the plastic. This definitely did feel like a graphic novel. But the thing, what also was great about it is this is written and drawn by Kevin Eastman. So we got the classic look for the turtles, black and white, back from the '80s look. I love the fact that, you know, uh, Kevin does give Peter Lard, you know, credit, shows him some love in the beginning of the book. Good stuff. Um, so we got all the factions, ninja factions. We got the foot. We got the savat, you know, purple dragons, the turtles. Everybody are involved in this over what? A briefcase. What's in that briefcase? Still not going to spoil it. But um, kind of Mike, uh, Raph and Casey get thrown into it in a sense, but this was really good, and it took me a while to read this. I think it took me a good detail-wise, took me a good two hours to read this. Like, it was it's that thick, and like I said, the price tag on this is $8.99, $9, and so, you know, it, it this is only for the hardcore fans um, of the Turtles, you know, I, I if you're a casual fan, no. You know, but if you're a casual fan, then just pick up uh, issue 15. Don't pick this up. But if you're a hardcore fan like moi, yeah, you pick it up. Um, this was just really, really good. I really enjoyed what I read, what I liked. And um, it was good to see the classic Kevin Eastman look for the Turtles. Good stuff. Oh, boy. So that's all the DC, I mean, independent. We'll end it. The final seven books come from Marvel. And the first one is none other than another book under Marvel now. A plus X. Uh, I, dude, I love good team-up books. I collected a lot of the Marvel team-up books back in the day. So I'm like, okay, if they're doing um, uh, Avenger and X-Men team-up book, great. I'll take it. Um, and we're going to get always different writers on it. Okay, so in this book, we have the first issue has two stories. The first first story is written by Dan Slott, and he tells a story of Cap in World War II, Cable coming to the past to uh, stop Trask, somebody, uh, a descendant of World War Trask, from interfering in the... Uh, in World War II. Okay, let's put it like this. We got a sentinel, a Nazi sentinel that Trash built. Um, you know, first, you know, Steve uh, Steve is not, you know, he's, he doesn't believe that Cable is from the future, you know, he's like that. He's like, I know about the sentinel of liberty and everything like that. You know, Steve Rogers, he's like, how do you know that? And things like that. It was really good. Um, the other one is written by Jeff Loeb, and he t he puts uh, Wolverine and Hulk together, and 
it takes place in the Avengers Tower. Wolverine is digging through the refrigerator and he's like, yes, whoever's chocolate cake this is, it's gone now. And then all of a sudden Wolverine turns around, it's Hulk, that's my cake. And then they're about to, like, I didn't see your name on it. And he's like, my cake, it's my cake, Wolverine. And uh, all of a sudden, older versions of the Hulk and Wolverine come through some kind of time stream portal and attack them in a sense. Well, they don't really attack them. They're looking for somebody else. They're looking for the Hulk, but not the original. They're looking for somebody else. And uh, Hulk re recognizes his older self, Ma Ma Maestro. And, you know, he's got the bearded look and the long hair Wolverine. And Wolverine's like, who the heck are you? And he's like, yeah, we're your older versions. And um, there's a battle that pursues them that. And it was fine. Um, they're able to get them out of the Avengers Tower. Um, Hulk does his famous, you know, seismic slap. And then smashes them out the window. And, you know, um, when they they teleport back. and they, We see them back in their future time. And we see who is who they commanded them to do this task. The president. The president, or we think, is none other than, from what it looks like, the Red Hulk. And it says, the Red Hulk must die. And I'm like, okay, so is they going to pick up some time in the future with that story? Because that was, now I'm a little bit interested in, in seeing what they're going to do. But for the first issue of A Plus X, it was actually fun. I, I did enjoy it. Just a fun, a fun team-up book, which we all like team-ups. And finally, we're, it's it's a team-up book. It's not them fighting each other, which I think Marvel needs to stop doing now is stop having hero versus hero. Okay, let's get back to old school hero versus villains. Okay, if you're going to do hero versus hero, then it's always done with respect in terms of misunderstanding. They join forces, end it with a, on a good note. They don't hate each other, in a sense. So, um, yeah, um, A plus X. Um, I know they could have came up. I think they could have came up with a better name, but um, I, I would have taken Avengers X-Men team-ups. That would have been cool. But uh, I think the next issue deals with Spider-Man and Beast teaming up. I've seen, I got a, plenty of books where te they teamed up good stuff, uh, past issues in my collection. Um and I, I'm forgetting the other. Oh, and Iron Man and Kitty Pride, I, I believe. Um, so, um, yeah, I wonder who's writing those. But Dan Slott's story was good, and Loeb's was okay. You know, it's Loeb. All right. Um, Avengers vs. X Men Consequences number four. Gillian Mark Brooks is the artist on this. Uh,. This was good, um, but once again, still confused with Cyclops. Some of the big key moments is Hope running, talking to Namor. Now, Namor seems to have gone back to his old school look with the, the green, uh, you know, his, his basically half naked look, you know, his, his green Speedo looks again. Um, and uh, he's talking to, you know, Hope, and she's talking about how, you know, this happen and everything like that and you know um he's she's looking for something when utopia fell and everything like that and you know she goes on to talk to namor about look you you attacked the country you attacked wakanda like and as you know wakanda is at war like has waged war on atlantis because of that and so that's why it's i'm really looking forward to seeing how panther and namor are going to be in the new Illuminati or quote unquote the new Avengers book because they're probably gonna have some blows. And I do like the fact that Panther is leading that that team. But um this was good. Um we also got to see where where uh, Colossus is, um things like that and Storm just really trying to come talk to her friend. You know, Storm and Colossus go way back. They go way back since 
1975, you know, with uh, the giant size X-Men number one. That's when they first met, you know, and, you know, they've, they've always been really good. And, you know, Colossus is really like in almost like literally solitary confinement. Does he have the juggernaut powers? Doesn't look like he has it. I don't think he does. Thank you. Um, and he just is really like, like, I don't care. Almost like I don't care anymore, you know. He even says to Storm, I want you to do so. If you see my sister again, he says something. I was like, never in a million years would I have ever thought her hearing those words come out of Colossus's mouth. Not going to spoil what he says to her. And then, of course, there's a confrontation between um, Magneto and Storm. Um, but, uh, it was good, and of course, the ending, of course, where, once again, you know, uh, Magneto tells Axis Cyclops, you know, uh, you want me to break you out? But this time, he's like, yeah. And it's like, villain it is. And I'm like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> it's just weird. Um... Kelly Sue DeConnick, of course. Um, Captain Marvel number six. Um, yeah, the two Marvels on the cover. Uh, we're still dealing with the time travel stuff. This is the final issue. Um, once again, I've told Kelly Sue DeConnick, I tweeted her and I said, you know, time travel, you know, I've always said, getting that out of the way was really kind of bold. It's bold to do that really quick because, you know, time you know time travel has been done out of the woodwork. We all know that. And it's just how you deliver it. You deliver it. Execute it. Um, Carol is with her, her mentor, her, her younger mentor, future, her, her younger self, her mentor, younger self, you know what I'm going at. And they're just watching almost the birth of Carol becoming Ms. Marvel, Captain Marvel, how she got her powers. And it's almost to the point where she is like, you know, are you going to stop this or anything like that? It was kind of weird. It was, it was like, yeah, are you going to stop this, Carol, and things like that? But um, it was fun. And, of course, you know, Spider-Woman is in this book because, you know, Carol and her are good friends, you know. And she pays a visit to her, her friend who's in a hospital, the older self, older version of her mentor. She's in a hospital and, you know, she's just like, well, Carol's. She's always said, if I'm away for a while, feed her cat and everything like that and, you know, check in on you and things like that. And she's all like, she'll be here. Don't worry. Uh, but it was still good. Um, very good indeed. Um, Kelly Sue they, uh, still does a good job. Um, number six, almost, almost four more to when they get to ten. But as always, I think we all have been saying... Let's get more than 50 issues out of Carol, right? In my opinion. All right. Um, next up. Uh, Ultimate Spider-Man. Um, this is a point sixteen point one. Uh, I, I really wasn't going to pick this up, you know, but I was just like, you know what? Let me just get it anyway. Uh, Bendis Marquez. All right. Now I want... Polonic back, and I hear she's coming back since, uh, 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 you know, uh, the original artist is coming back soon. Um, basically, this is a concept. The concept of this is simple. The ultimate version of Betty Brant, Betty Brant, is basically wants to know who the new Spider-Man is, and she starts digging and digging and digging and digging and digging, and some of them, a lot of the other writers or reporters at the Daily Bugle are like, you know, did Peter the death of Peter Parker not solve anything? You put that out there and you're putting you're endangering his family and everything like that. And at you know, in a sense you're looking at this because if this was six one six Betty, she would understand it. But this ultimate version of Betty is like she's so persistent and she's like, you know, this and that. And it almost comes as like, what are you thinking? Like, why are you doing this? And it really gets down and gritty. And I think she's she dies at the end of the book. I'm going to spoil this, guys. 
she I believe she is killed by none other than yes I'm gonna spoil it if you don't want to be spoiled leave now or mute it she she goes back to her apartment and she's doing this and everything and then all of a sudden a presence is behind her we don't know who it is but then it's almost like she's like please whatever you just don't hurt me and everything please and it, you just see like 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 you know like flesh something ripping through flesh you know the sound effect of something ripping through flesh and she's just laying on the floor bleeding out who's there venom yeah so it seems that uh old miles is gonna is gonna be dealing with venom somewhere down the line um this was okay it was okay not great great but it was okay but I, 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 it, yeah, Ultimate Betty Brand is not, you know, in a sense, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, um, yeah, that's it. That, that's basically it. Um, next up. Wow. You guys still with me? You still with me, right? Okay. Um, I was just talking about this. Uh, Winter Soldier number 12, Brubaker. Um, that's a cool cover of uh, uh, Bucky and Wolverine on a cover. Bucky behind Wolverine. Wolverine taking the bullets. <laughs> um, there's still the hunt for Black Widow still going on. Bucky does something so desperate to get, um, to get his love back. You know, he loves, he loves Widow. He reprogrammed, gets reprogrammed back to his old Winter Soldier way. Good idea? Hell no. Bad idea? Hell yes. Um, and uh, it kind of doesn't go right. Wolverine is trying to keep on his scent, you know, make sure he, and Bucky's not making it easy. You know, he, and I love Wolverine talking about it. You know, I forget how good he, he was. You know, he he's able to keep me from getting, like he, Bucky is, instead of going through, like, you know, just walking through tunnels and Bucky's like clouding his scent with like, uh, other like rain and things like that. And Wolverine's like, this rain ain't helping. It's not even helping either. My, you know, I can't keep up. Keep, I'm losing. No, I'm sometimes I have a lock and then I lose it, you know, like, like, uh, smoke, sm smoke heaters. Bucky's traveling through that and blocking his scent, things like that. Just showing that. He's good. Bucky's good. And he knows he knows Wolverine. And he even says that when he gets Wolverine. He shoots Wolverine and he's like, Yeah, I, I know who you are and everything like that. And um now you gotta remember he's back to under his winter soldier programming that he was and I love the line that Bucky uses. He's like, you know, when you're programmed, people think that you're not there anymore. You're there. You're there. It's almost like he said, basically he said you're just watching everything happen. The lights are on, but you're, you can just only watch. You can't do anything about it. But it's mainly about, he, he felt that that was the only play he can use to find Widow. And, you know, Maria Hill and all of them are like, you know, that this was kind of not a good idea. Cap is not really, he's upset about it. So what happens is, they're like, okay, what, wh where would he go, and who would, who would, what would they want? Who would be some of his targets? You know, because he's back under Winter Soldier. Believe it or not, one of his targets is none other than the man without fear, Daredevil. Yeah, so he goes, Daredevil. You see Daredevil in his apartment, like just exercising. All of a sudden, he hears Bucky coming. He's like, and. You know, Bucky's trying to shoot at him. You know, you're not gonna sneak up on Daredevil. You know, <laughs> but he know he's like, I know you. You're you're Natasha's man, uh, Bucky Barnes. But you're dead. Like, remember, everybody still thinks he's dead. You know, but yeah, it was that's good. I'm wondering where that's gonna lead. Um, good stuff though. And speaking of good stuff, Wolverine and X Men makes its introduction into the Marvel now. Um, Brubaker. Bradshaw's artwork is now really, I'm accepting it more. Um, 
This is issue number 19. And not only are we seeing the Kitty looking for a new teacher, um, we also are um, we're looking for the uh, Wolverine and Rachel Hunt Summers Gray Summers whoever, are looking for the the Hellfire Club for what they did to you know the that certain character that we thought died. Um, this was really funny. Um, just seeing all the characters just try to come in and, you know, offer their opportunity. You know, Blade was the first and, you know, he's like, you know, you hire me, I'll teach your students how to deal with vampires and stuff like that. And she's like, Kitty's like, next. But I love how Deflock said, you know, uh, vampire accountings are getting more occurrence now. It's just as current as this and that, and even heroes versus heroes. And I was like, oh. I just thought that was funny. Um, you got Deadpool coming next, long shot next. You know, uh, Puck and Sasquatch from Alpha Flight. We're Puck and Sasquatch, and we're Canadian. There, I'm like, why'd you put that in there? Did you have to? What is so wrong with being Canadian? And that's nothing wrong with being Canadian. And I have a lot of Canadian subscribers that I love and respect. So what the hell? Like, But um, next, Dr. Nemesis. Next, uh, Ghost Rider. Next, you know, it. Um, Deadpool comes back. You know, I did next. What you got? Come on, please. Next. It was it was really. Then um, uh, Firestar comes in and I'm like, she should know all of them. Like. And but she's like, you know, I I want to like Iceman next. You know, I was like, oh, I knew that was coming. Um, it's it. You know, Peter Spider Man comes and he's like, I I just got to see this. I heard it, it's true. Is it really true? He's kept filming everything. First, he had came. If I'm not mistaken, he was in this issue as his as Peter Parker first. Then he came as Spider Man, and he's 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 like next. Until she finally chooses who we, it's good to see back. Um, I'm not gonna spoil who that is. Even though, once again, even though the book's been out for a while, I'm not gonna spoil it. But um, it was funny. It was really funny. Um, and just seeing what those the kids of the Hellfire Club. Now it's to the point, guys, where you really have to be like, they they're kids, but they are totally screwy they are totally in leagues to handle the big boys because these kids as a mentor are sons of bitches these kids are just really making it very hard for the school and um there was something else i wanted to talk about oh husk yeah sh husk husk is um Husk is losing it. Yeah, Paige is losing it. She she really is having some problems. She she's losing it. She's definitely losing it. You see her talking to uh Toad, and Toad is like, you know, why'd you, you know, why'd they fire you? And she like, no, I quit. And they said I need some, they need me to do like, you know, psychiatrical evaluation before I can be teach again. And you just literally see her. So look at me, Mordred. Do it, Mortimer. Do I look like I need help? She now, as you all know, Paige's mutation is she can rip the, you know, excess skin off her, and underneath will be like a different substance, you know, in a sense. So if she wanted to have like steel-like skin, like Colossus, I think she had just have to think about it and rip it off, and it'll be there. And you just see all these, you know, different types of skin. And it's like, she's got, she's having problems. And I'm hoping they, Aaron's pick keeps up on that and gets her brother, her big brother, uh, Sam Gunthry, you know, uh, Cannonball involved in it because she really is having problems. She, she's, she's flipping out and she has some psychological problems that needs to be deal with. And, and she, they got to deal with it fast before she's a, she can, she'll hurt somebody or hurt herself. But other than that, um, Wolverine X-Men, 
Number 19. Very good. Aaron's still good at what he does. Um, and last but not least, for the books for this week, the final, quote-unquote, once again, quote-unquote, final issue of X-Men Legacy uh, is 275. Um, Christoph Gage, first of all, you did a great job, sir. You really turned this book around, even though it became more of a rogue book, but you did turn it around. Very good. Look at the cover. That's Mark Brooks's uh, artwork on there. I always love covers like this. They're classic, still great. You know, just see, um, as you can see, Rogue in the center. Rogue. Gotta love Rogue. Um, pretty much this is just Rogue dealing with a prison break. Her and the Mimic, who I'm really glad they brought back, because I always thought the Mimic was cool. And I think he, he is a mutant. Um, his powers deal with more like Rogue. He Once he's in vicinity of somebody who's power, he can mimic their powers, hence the name Mimic. Um, um, and they're dealing with this prison break. This Now, they're kind of outnumbered because all these different mutants, or I think they're mutants, you know, they're, they're outgunned, they're outmatched, even with Rogue. They know about Rogue. They know about Rogue. Like, don't let her touch you. Everything like that, you know. They're like, don't let her touch you. Don't let her touch you. And, you know, Rogue knows that she needs help. So she acts as one of the guards, who I'm thinking is, looks like one of the, remember the classic group, the jury? That's who I thought one of those was. And I'm like, is that one of the members of the jury? And he's like, you know, where are the other guards? And like, there are some in cell block D or C. They're, they're on good behavior and everything like that. And Rogue goes in there and she's like, look, I need your help. You know, I, I need to borrow some of your powers to help out and everything. And then a lot of the guards are like, uh, go get out of here, woman. You know, get out of here. You know, we're not going to help you, everything like that. And look, she, she Rogue really sets it down on her mind. She's all like, I, I know, you know, I'm not even going to try to pull that Southern accent. But she's more like, you know, I know that it's hard. You know, being what you are, I had to go through this myself, you know, but I had good people to help me, you know, and you really start to see she starts to really make a connection with some of the inmates, you know, um, some of them was like, you know what, one of them, the first one actually says, look, I have a kid and I don't want her to hate me. I'll help. Rogue touches her, touches him, he gains the power. And, you know, some of the other guards like, you made your death wish now. You got Man Bull saying, I'll help. Man Bull help. You got Armadillo saying, I'll help. She taps his hour. And she's like, thank you and everything. I'll do whatever I can. I won't forget this. This book just showed right here, once again, why Rogue is so good and why she is my favorite female character. Number one. In comics yes even before the likes of Wonder Woman yeah that's me that's just me I'm keeping it real people she pretty much then you got the guard saying like now all those you know basically all those other inmates are like now you're gonna pay for what you did like once this is over we're coming out and she wrote just like no if you touch them if you any of you touch them I'll show you why you, it's not good to be on my bad side. You basically, you don't want to see me when I was bad. And Rogue just goes in there and deals with the, the rest of the, and she's all souped up on powers and stuff. It was really good. Um, this was just really good. It was a good send off for Mr. Gage, you know, um, and a good send off for the final, this final volume of, of uh, X-Men Legacies. Um, till they go into the next volume, which is going to have, you know, um, uh, I'm forgetting, you know, Xavier's son, Legion. And I don't know, guys, you know, for me, I've never been, a, I was never really a big fan of Legion. Um, I just, you know, was like, eh, you know, whatever. But um, for Christoph Gage, you did a good job. Very good. Uh, you turned the book around. And I kind of had dropped X-Men Legacies for a long time because I didn't like the 
I didn't like Carrie's work. I wasn't liking Mark Carrie's kind of writing. When Gage came back on and he kind of really started to center the characters, it was good. Um, good stuff. Whew. All right. Um, anyway, guys, um, that is all the books for the past two weeks. This week's books will be up soon. I will get that review up soon when I finish reading them. I do have my books. Um, where are they? <laughs> um, uh, sorry about that. As you can see, I have all my books right here. Um, I'll get those up whenever I finish reading them. Um, right now, I can tell you I got a about 6 DC um, uh, so six, about 7 Marvel and 2 Dynamo 2 uh, Independent including yeah Shadow Man so I'll get this up um, I'll get these reviews up I'll get this review up later on um, but I just wanted to get the review for the past books that came out, guys, as always. And um, once again, thank you for all um, the get. I you know, hope you're doing well, kid. You know, I heard about, you know, Hurricane Sandy. I hope you're fine. I hope your family's fine. Thank you guys so much for that. I appreciate that very much. Um, and I will see you guys on the next episode as well. Oh, yeah. Another thing before I go, uh, once again, show some love to my mentor um for showing some love back as well um and more importantly a lot of people probably been asking where is mr where's mr orpheus we haven't seen him introduce you he'll be back next week um he'll be back next week uh he's giving me a notice and i i don't mind that but he said he'll be back next week uh, guys but other than that I went on long enough. Um, like I said, if you stayed around for an hour plus, thank you. Um, but other than that, I will see you guys next time on the next episode. As I said before, the review for these books will be up soon um, when I finish reading them. And other than that, this is my learning kid. Peace, for love. Stay tuned. Keep it real, guys. As always, take care.